Solo Pro Radio. I am the uh, host today on this wonderful show where we talk to solopreneurs in all walks of life, and you get some idea of all the variety of careers that solos are holding and filling and uh, performing great work out there in the world. Uh, I hope that you will go to my website, www.bettersmarterricher.com, where you can take a look at the work that I do as a coach and a business consultant, helping solos find financial success. And as solos, you can be creatives, you know, writers, artists, painters, musicians, or you might be an encore entrepreneur, which we're going to talk a bit about today. And those are people that are 50-plus that are working to monetize their expertise. As I like to say, experience equals opportunity. Also, if you go to my website, bettersmarterrichard.com, you can get my free ebook, which shows you the seven principles that a solo really must follow in order to get financial success. And it's an opportunity to join in the conversation on the blog, sign up for our free newsletter. And also, we, we participate, we learn about Better, Smarter, Richer principles through um, study groups. And our course of the study group is now up on www.opensesame.com, as well as it's available through the Oregon Small Business Development Center Network. So tune in, join us, and like us on Facebook, and today enjoy our conversation. Hopefully you too will become inspired and encouraged and a little more excited about being financially successful as a solopreneur. As I said, we've got a great guest today. Her name is Laura Schlafly. She's the founder of Career Choices with Laura, which is a business where she guides and inspires baby boomers and mid-career professionals to investigate and launch Encore Careers. The focus of her business is those 50-plus. Laura is not only an Encore Career Coach, she's also a professional speaker and writer. Laura has a BA in Japanese Study and an MBA in Marketing. She herself has been a serial boomer entrepreneur plus 20 years of hands-on practical experience in product marketing, field sales, and small business development. Hello, Laura. Good morning, Jackie. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here today. I am really glad, and it's gorgeous outside, and we're just going to have a gorgeous conversation. So I'm Isn't looking that forward true? to we've, that. We've, we've waited a long time here for spring, <laughs> and boy, if it hasn't sprung today, I, I can't even imagine. So, Laura, you've really had a varied career. Why don't you tell our audience about your background and how you came to be an Encore career coach? Absolutely, and I will expand on some of those uh, points that you just mentioned, Jackie. I really, uh, I think I'll start with the area that led to my degree in Japanese studies, and that was my whole interest in things Asian, which began at age 12, and, I'm, and I grew up in Ohio, by the way, <clears throat> a Midwest, you know, com- uh, area of the world in the United States, and so that, that meant something that wasn't so positive for majoring in something related to all things Asian. And uh, so basically, I got my degree, and I was ready to just jump out and do something, but whoops, I... You know, I married my high school sweetheart, and life got in the way, and uh, other work ensued because I was actually 10 years too early with that, with that capability, at least in the you know, middle part of this country. And uh, so I said to myself, look, I've got to make money, you know, and uh, we went to graduate school, my husband and I, and I said, I, I'm going to get an MBA. You know, I, enough of this Asian thing. You know, I just don't want to be a, a teacher of that or anything like that, so... That set me up uh, really then for when we moved to Miami, Florida, for uh, he got a job before I did out of grad school, and I was just, uh, again, working in uh, the marketing field and then a medical technology company, and then that led to uh, a data communications company, and that set me up for my career for the next, uh, well, through the year 2000. I was working in various... uh, Technology companies, mostly with communications, um, networks were forming, server networks, and I did sales for that, and, and all that kind of thing. Um, that was my career, nothing Asian. But there was a, a really significant um, part, Jackie, in that, that whole thing up through 2000. I took about two and a half years out of my life to 
take over and run and turn around my family business, which actually uh, was based in Ohio, even though I was living in Miami. And that was the most uh, that was the most significant experience of my life. And then I sold the company, and that was all a significant experience. It was <clears throat> learning by fire, and thank God for my MBA. Really, it really helped a lot. So, um, so that was significant. And then when the dot bomb happened um, around 2001, when there was a crash in you know, the technology stocks and, the, and those kind of businesses, um, I lost my job. And, um, and I had also been divorced the year before, so it was two big whammies. And uh, th- those years of the 90s were you know, my high-earning years that uh, people who sold technology products and network products and all that were really making excellent money. <clears throat> so I decided that at that point that I, I wanted to move out of Miami. It never really aligned with my Asian interests, and that's when I came to Portland after looking at several other cities. And when I came here, I made a decision not to go back to working for somebody else, and uh, <clears throat> I started really networking again in the Asian communities here, and uh, I formed a business, which I still have, but it's, you know, it's it was very much damaged by our 2008 um, economic downturn here. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so uh, I have that, but I, that, it, when I turned 60, I, it hit me, and I said, I want one more career, and I want a career of something of my choice. I don't want to work for somebody else. And I, I worked with a career counselor and coach, and um, we evolved to this whole concept that I would be good in the field of helping others with their careers, and I started my business, Career Choices with Laura, um, in, around March of uh, 2000, let's see, 2011. So I'm, I'm just wow. a couple years, couple years old in this business, um, and then it was only maybe about three or four months after that when I was really honing in what was my focus in that career coaching piece, and <clears throat> I did, there was something going on about Mark Friedman and Encore Careers, and he was on public broadcasting, and I heard about that, and it just clicked with me. It just totally clicked that I wanted to serve that market, because that market is me, was me, and it always yeah. will be me. I'm a boomer, yeah, and that's how I got into my business. Well, that's just and fabulous. I, I love your story. Yeah. You know, and, and there's so many elements, Laura, of your story that, uh, you know, we've had many guests on this show, and it just seems that many of them have exactly that. They're moving along one path, and then, bang, you know, the universe intervenes, and, uh, you know, a diver- divorce, a family business crisis, maybe a health crisis mm-hmm. sometimes, a, you know, a total reconsidering of what you're doing, what you're here for, what's important to you. And you wind up taking off on, you know, the absolute solo career that, you know, you probably could have been doing a long time ago, but now it's time and, you know, you're going to do it and do it very successfully and passionately and um, create a whole new life for yourself. I love that yes. story. Yes. That's cool. Yes. So true. Congratulations for doing that. I yeah. think that's just wonderful. It's kind of my story, too. So, you know, I'm, I'm really aware of that. And, uh you know, we reach an age in our lives, maybe it used to be 40 was the midlife crisis, and, you know, with the uh, longevity bonus that they're telling us we're enjoying, maybe maybe 60 is now the place where we have these earth-shaking, you know, uh, turnarounds in our lives, because you're not the first one I've talked to who has talked about it happening at that age, and we finally say, you know, it's time for me to do what I really love to do and what I yes. really wanted to do in the first place, and... You know, what I dreamed about when I was back in Ohio and, <laughs> you know, and take it on. Yeah. And there's like, more to that story. For? Which, yeah, we'll, we'll get to more of that story. Yeah. So in your work in Career Choices uh, with Laura, how do you integrate your wide and varied interests and experience into your work? Well, I think that what happens is it, it opens my mind having that experience <clears throat> opens my mind to the potential possibilities for others. And, uh-huh. you know, what could be, uh, <clears throat> what could that be for their purpose? And, um, and this whole idea of purpose is, is really integral, you know, I think, to our conversation.
conversation today. Um, I I have sort of um, both a, a real, a very real and hardcore, as well as an intuitive understanding of <clears throat> some of the fields and roles, you know, from my own experience, sales and marketing and technology and a business owner of the family business, which was industrial, and, um, you know, my wide variety of my hobbies, which we didn't go into, but I could throw out photography and I've been a private pilot and uh, I love dance, uh, foreign languages, music, I play the piano and uh, golf, you know, so a lot of things, <clears throat> scuba diving and all that that I used to do in Miami, but I don't. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I just, because I think I, I have a wide range of things that I do in, in my work and in my play, and um, I can really see transferable skills happening. Uh, oh, that's cool. And, and then you mentioned um, the personal side. I mean, I have that understanding of what it's like to go through divorce, uh, a major move across the country, death uh, of the parent, uh, you know, and plus being in the boomer age bracket. So I, all of that I integrate into my interest in my work. I love it that you said that it helps you open your mind to possibilities for others. I, I think that alone would make you a very good um, career coach for people because, you know, as you and I have talked before, sometimes people can't see their possibilities, whereas in my life, I've always said I have the curse of the consultants. I see possibilities <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> and you don't mind sharing them because you're a consultant. No, no, and... You know, I just I just kind of think that way. As I said, I finally titled it The Curse of the Consultants, you know. And um, I, I, I really think that uh, people get kind of ground down and, and boxed in uh, sometimes in their thinking. And they, you know, they don't look up and see the broad horizon of possibilities that obviously you see, you know, when you're interested not only in all things Asian, but photography, you know, being a pilot, dance, you know, golf, foreign languages. What a, um, a broad and energetic life that you've had, and of course that would help you see possibilities for others. That's fabulous. Some, pe- some people might call that being a dilettante, and that, that's true. <laughs> you know, not me. <laughs> moderately good at a lot of things, an ex- not an expert in none. In any. Well, but you're, you've tied it all together very neatly to be an expert in, in career choices for people. Right. You know, you've Right. You've drawn on all that past experience and, you know, and you've tied it up in a nice package of helping other people envision futures for themselves. Mm-hmm. So what, what, you know, do you want to talk a little bit more about what uh, caused you to focus your work on the Encore market? Like I said, it was sort of that seminal moment when somebody mentioned about the fact that there was... Uh, a movement, I, I, I started calling it a movement later, <clears throat> around this whole idea of encore careers, second careers in the second half of life, you know, a midlife or a mid, could be a mid-career uh, change. And um, it just struck me because I am one and, uh, you know, the piece about losing my own job in 2001. Mm-hmm. So um, I just feel... I, I feel and sense their desire to know what's next, to know if they haven't really contemplated um, what is their purpose here, you know, what is their divine spark is another phrase I, I heard recently, uh, <clears throat> to, you know, to be able to use it for good in the world, you know, uh, that was was initially, and it might be shifting a little bit with the Ankara movement, was all about uh having people in their boomer, later boomer years around, you know, 55, 60, 65, doing good works and focusing their talents there. But with the downturn, which happened after uh, Mark Friedman wrote the book uh, about Encore, um, there's a little bit more shift to, well, we can't all afford to be focusing all our energy and talents into social good. So that's where I come in and help people also uh, find true work that is going to be the best for them. And, and um, you know, a- I think you do great social good when you're supporting yourself. 
It's right? true. You're, you're supporting the economy as well. Yeah. When yeah. You're working, I mean, when, you're, when you are self-supporting and you are, um, you know, engaged, you're uh, doing good work, you're earning your own way, uh, you're staying out of the uh, safety net programs, you're contributing to society, you know, whether or not you're doing it as a social enterprise or simply doing it to uh, bring forth your vision of the world and do good work and make money to take care of yourself, I think that's equally important, you know? That's, and that's very as, true. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, I mean, how what, it starts here. You know, it starts with us here taking care of ourselves and modeling that uh, before we go out and uh, take care of others. You know, this is like if gas masks drop from above, you know, put your own mask on first and then help other people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I like that analogy. Yeah. yeah, I think that's very, very big. And, you know, I love the discussion about your purpose because when I'm talking to people, I'm saying, well, what are you passionate about? Because that's where you get a clue of what you're really supposed to be doing. It's what really, truly excites you, you know? I mean, I keep laughing that we don't come into the world with little instructions clutched in our hand, you know? And so we kind of have to find our way, and it's the feeling of passion that we have about things that calls to us and helps us know what we're really supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be paying attention to. So, And, and you know, the interesting thing, Jackie, is that truly... Um, I think your gifts uh, are innate. Your true gifts and talent are innate. Never mind the skills that you learned for your jobs. Um, they've, you've always got it in you, and it's it's another kind of process to look within and not externally for, for what those are. Yes. Um, so that's yes. the point I want to make. And, and what is, I think, what I'm seeing with the encores is that uh, they know the there's an end in sight, and <coughs> if not now, we <laughs> You know, right. Hey, it's time to get moving. I'm still healthy. Exactly. You know, I'm still creative. I'm still energetic. I'm still uh, interested. I'm, you know, I've got uh, what we've created. As I said, um, we're talking about the longevity bonus of an extra 25 or 30 years that people are experiencing in their life expectancy. And, you know, it's kind of like, hey, not now. When are you going to do this? I think, I think I'll do it now. So what, what are some of the special challenges that encores have when they're seeking to change or revitalize their careers? Are there special challenges they've got at, at 50 plus? Well, you know, you, you, you just mentioned one of them, and that is that we are living, you know, 20 to 30 years longer than the prior generations. And, and you mentioned the, the other phrase about what do we do with these extra bonus years? And definitely the people who created Social Security and, and, and on after who've taken over running it weren't thinking about the fact that there was going to be this wave. And so we are still stuck in this paradigm of the old model of retiring at 65. I mean, it all revol- revolves around that. So it's like this is new, and but we're stuck in, you know, it's new that, that we're living longer. Nobody, it's not really new, but nobody really planned for it in all aspects of our entitlement packages here, and they, there's still the old retirement mentality, so uh, they, we have to get beyond that, and we are, and um, I would say other issues would be um, our health, uh, you know, our health challenges, and you know, as we're living longer, yes, we're healthier, but we still, there's a point of decline, and there's other challenges that have come about, you know, for other reasons in, in our environment or our lives, so that would be uh, some issue, and I would say um, uh, we, we've we come from a model, uh, as boomers of our parents, uh, who traditionally, they call them the silent generation, you know, that they had maybe one or two main jobs for their whole life, and now we see that no longer is definitely not true. Um, so, again, the new paradigm, I would say... Financially, you know, we've had to move from the pension plans, defined benefit plans, you know, to other plans that were offered to us, I would say, starting in the late 80s, I think it was, first 401k came about, and um, mid-80s, something like that. We're also struggling, if you look at what's happened 
to to our cohort is that there is an average of uh, sixty thousand dollars, roughly, I think it is, that it, uh, people have in their savings accounts today, and that uh, what is it like about forty three percent of households don't have enough money, you know, to operate in you know throughout their retirement. So there's a lot of scary figures, you know, that AARP has come out with. So those are all challenges that are shocking. Um, the entitlements, so-called entitlements, are, are obviously being chipped away, and they, they probably needed to be, you know, revised long right. ago, and now right. it's just a big battle. And I've, let me think of a couple more. I would say um, learning to be in charge of our own careers. Wow, what a, what a concept, you know, that we, uh, you know, we've gone along, and there was career management, but it was like sort of the employer was managing it for us, and that's not true. We own our careers. We own ourselves. And so we're, we're no longer in that, that model. We shouldn't be. Or we're trying to get out of it. Let's put it that way. It's not gone. I, it definitely is still an issue. For the boomers. It does. Yeah, and I think you're naming things that are just absolutely in our face. You know, we, we, you talked about um, uh, the surprise, I call it, that we knew for a long time, you know, after all the baby boomer generations last year, 1964, and that's almost 50 years ago, you know, that we've known there was this mass right group coming through the population pipeline. And um, but I think the surprise was how many of that group are healthy. And they're not only healthy, they're curious, they're interested, they're skilled, they're experienced, they're, you know, they're interested in the world, they're, you know, they're vital, they're part of the community. I think that has caught a lot of people flat-footed. Uh, they didn't expect that. You know, they kind of expected that old paradigm from the silent generation that you would get old and, you know, suddenly you'd have to be in an in, um, a adult foster home or an assisted living center. And, and, you know, that's not, there's some of that going on, but it's not happening in the, the way I think a lot of people thought. Um, as I say, I think the energy and enthusiasm of the, you know, the 50 pluses has caught a lot of people by surprise. And, right, um, I agree. It's a, it's, it's a, it's an interesting surprise. It's a pleasant surprise, actually, because when people are, you know, healthy and energetic, they can and take charge of their own financial well-being and their own careers. And so, like me, you're in the job of getting people to think differently about their future. Big stuff. So, Laura, I can tell you're definitely a solopreneur. What, what do you find is your favorite part of being a solo? I like my freedom. <laughs> I, I like, you know, I made, as I said, I made that decision um, within the first year of moving here and uh, here, to, here in the Portland area. And um, I just decided I'm not going back. I mean, I could hear the ring of my sales manager's voice. Thanks for the great month you did, Laura. What are you doing for me next month? You know, that kind of thing. I'm just yeah. so done with that. Um, and so I, I like that fact. I can change and do what I want. And um, I don't have children, so I don't have, you know, issues with families. And I don't have a husband, so, you know, I have, that's even more freedom. Not that I would tout that arrangement. But um, and the other thing, um, I, I like that it forces me to grow. Uh -huh. um, there's a self-growth. It's just like after divorce. It forced me to grow. And this this forces so much new learning about doing the business, all the, you know, all the pieces that you do, Jackie, so well with your clients um, and all the learning that needs to take place and the challenges and the pride I, I get from, from the whole thing. So that's, like that's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. And I love the way you said it. I love the, the heart that you had in your voice and you said, I love my freedom. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that's the biggest thing that many solos like. You know, what a, it's a wonderful way to uh, take care of your own, to take charge of your own financial well-being and bring your expertise and your unique, because it is unique because of, think of all the background you have, your unique skill set and talent and point of view to the world. And then find other people need what you do. And, uh, oh, that's, that's heady stuff, if you ask me, you know, <laughs> to, to find your spot and to find 
all this stuff that you've worked your whole life in creating and learning and packaging it together and find there are people that say, that's exactly what I need. And that's, I say, that's heady stuff, if you ask me. (laughs) So what do you like least about being a solo? Well, you know, it's almost the flip side of the freedom um, of being on my own, and it's that, for me, I I think it can be isolating at times. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of us solos uh, have home home offices, which I do. There's no need for me to pay rent for a formal office. So that can be uh, another part of it. I mean, you don't, if you're solo, obviously you don't have employees. Um, So that would be a part that I would say that needs to be looked out for and worked on uh, in various Mm -hmm. ways. And then I guess the other part is because you don't have employees and all that, but you do have to create your own team of people to support you and finding good team members, you know, like somebody that do radio shows, okay, so, or somebody to help <clears throat> with a website and uh, the marketing, promotion, and, and, you know, if you have so many admin tasks, you need uh, a virtual assistant or any kind of piece like that, the photographer, you know, um, you have to find them, but the good thing is you don't have to employ them uh, beyond the project. So, and then the, I would say the last part is that I am my sole support, you know, there is, um, uh, especially if you're a solo and you are a single solo, then you are totally your own support, so that can be a little scary at times. A little daunting, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I I think you're right, and um, I think that, um, you know, your first one of it being so isolating uh, is one of the reasons that coffee shops are doing so well, because... You know, I think people go and, you know, get a Wi-Fi connection and a cup of coffee and, you know, they may not be working with people, but they're working around other people and conversation and motion and activity going on and, mm-hmm. you know, and that, that feels pretty good as opposed to, you know, sitting alone in your own, uh, you know, sunroom or back bedroom or, you know, basement or wherever it is that you're working from at home, that you at least get a little social interaction. So who who would be a good typical client for you? Um, well, I think about um, the ones that I, I have, and they're both men and women. Initially, I think it was more men than women, um, but it seems to be evening out. And I, I, in my experience, and again, these are people that <clears throat> come to me or my clients, they range from like 45, age 45 to 65. I would say that's mm-hmm. been the range. And um, and what I what I desire is my client, and that is uh, turning out to be that way. As I say they're in midlife uh, professionals. Um, they are uh, actually I, I've categorized them um, in the past as in having three. Uh, segments to them. One, um, I say they're employed and disillusioned. Mm-hmm. You know, they want to change. They're not fulfilled in what they're doing at work. Their talents aren't fully really respected or realized. <clears throat> they don't feel appreciated. And then the second category would be those who are out of work and anxious. Um, they were downsized. They were fired. There was a merger with a company. Um, or they are uh, coming back to the workforce after raising kids. Uh, so they had a career, and then maybe 15 years later, they're coming back, or maybe a little less, but I've, I've seen many, you know, women in their 50s, uh, early 50s, that they're coming back, and it's all changed, you know. Or maybe there's a divorce. So that's an out of work and anxious. And then the third category, which right now I'm not seeing as much of, but I think it's going to happen more, um, is pre-retirees. So people, um, whether they're employed or unemployed, they just want to stay engaged as they age. So after, right. if they're planning on a leaving of their, of their career work and selling their business or selling their own business, then they also are looking at, like, how can I stay engaged? And I still want to make some money. I don't need to make as much, but I, I want to do something. So I would say those are three categories of typical clients. Oh, wonderful. Those are broad categories. That's pretty wonderful. There's a lot of those people out there, Mm -hmm. and um, it's pretty nice. So how do you find your clients? Yeah, 
or how they find me, well, that's even better. Yeah. I did have somebody contact me from your uh, your posting of this show today. Somebody contacted me yesterday. and oh, cool. um, Yes, and, and I've had people um, who, uh, there are resume writers who refer people to me because um, they that's what they do best and they don't want to get into the whole career coaching piece, so people find me through those referrals. Um, I have a blog, which I've had since uh, November 2011. And um, so I post things there. I also am a guest blogger. I do, right now, I guest blog for uh, Max List here in Portland. Social media posts, and I belong to those LinkedIn groups that apply. You know, there's Encore.org and other groups, so people see those. I've done some publicity, getting myself into a local paper. Um, you know, it's something I, I need to do more of, and it's a matter of so much time, you know. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I need to add another person to my team. Um, through my uh, religious, uh, my, my church affiliation, I've found people through volunteering, like I've volunteered for Dress for Success and AAA, and um, and then, well, the ever-faithful website and uh, search engine optimization probably brings it in to some extent. So I, oh, that's great. That's my main ways, yeah. Those are all wonderful tools, and... You know, I love that you've got a referral network. I think that's the best, you know. When we have a referral network, it just seems that um, uh, it's such a, it's much easier to, you know, using sales jargon, close that sale because you already come pre-recommended and um, people love that. And you love that, you know, because people know something about you before they ever even get there and they have somebody that has said good things about you. So great way to market so when someone comes to you and is just determined to make a change in their life, how do you go about helping them? Well, as a professional, I mean, I use sort of an intake method of questioning mm -hmm. um, them to understand what they really want. I mean, that's my first question. What is it that you want? Mm -hmm. And this can cause them to pause. It can cause a silence. Um, it's, but it helps them eventually, through further questioning around that, get clear on what they want, or at least at that point in time, their expectations, you know, what ifs, what matters to them. And then that becomes the foundation and a framework of our work together. It's really a process of gaining clarity for them and finding their purpose, hopefully a passion. And if, they, if they're looking for the paycheck and don't want to be in their own business, that too. And so... Um, and then I just have a, um, just a, a top-level view of, you know, processes. So that includes a discovery process. That's, I kind of describe that. Um, then we go into look at the strategy for their career. You know, do they want to, are they using transferable skills to, to go to something else, or do they completely want to change everything, or they want to start their own business? Um, and then, then a separate piece of going into job search, if they want to do that, um, I will I will work with them on that. So, and 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 to to what you do, if they are led out of all of this to start their own business, then once they get to that point and they need the mechanics of that, I I recommend them to you know someone like you or other you know resources to handle oh, that's the great. development piece. Yeah. So it sounds to me. You know, that when someone finds you, they are finding an advocate and a teammate and a confidant and, you know, someone that is really takes their situation and their wants and desires to heart and that you dig enough that you've, you're you really tuned in to what they really want to do and um, you help them take the next steps. What a great service you're offering. So... I, I love that, and, and sometimes they come in with something in mind, and we work together, and it's not what they end up with because it turns out that, that something different is better, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and I would gather that you kind of have a gift of listening, so, um, you know, when people talk to you, it's quite amazing, and they, they build trust with you, and then maybe tell you their heart's desire instead of, you know, what they've been talking about on the surface for years, and they will yes. drop down and talk to you about what's really important to them. You've got it. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So I understand that unemployment rates for boomers are quite high. Do you find that true? And, and you know, how, how is the market for 50-plus encores making a career change and finding a job? Well, and, and I don't have all the, um, right at my fingertips, the, the labor statistics, but I, I disagree in, um, from, from what I've read is that it's not the unemployment rates for the 50-plus that is quite high or is being bantered about. It's the fact that the length of time that they are unemployed. So mm-hmm. I think their employment, their unemployment rate is not as, as high as uh, younger people. So their actual rate of unemployment is not as high, I, so I dispute that statement, but it's the length of time they're unemployed. They're much more likely to be unemployed. And I, I just read something uh, this week that said that for older workers, they call it older workers, the Labor Department says that on average unemployment duration is 53 weeks. So you can say well, basically yeah. a year. Now that's yeah. an average, so you know, it, I mean, so we know what it could be on the high end. Um, so, and, and did you ask me, did you wonder about the market for Yeah, what's the market for 50 plus on courts, you know, looking to find a new career or find a job? Is it pretty good? And it, you know, it, ranges all over the place, but I, well, in, in terms of my own localization here in the Portland area, um, I think in general it's not so great, um, and the longer you're out of work, the, f- the more difficult it gets, and especially if you're in the technology realm or you've been in IT or something like that, you know, that stuff just changes always, and so... If you're not keeping up with it in some way, you quickly will grow out of that career. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say that um, there are people who are determined to stay in Portland because they love it for the lifestyle and all that. But we don't have, I don't see that we have a deep economy here, you know, mm-hmm. uh, a, a deep level of any kind of industry. Um You've got the apparel folks, and then you've got Intel. But beyond that, nothing is really deep. What is deep, or what is broad, is people being in business for themselves. Right. And and that is what's happening. So there is a good market for um, for people doing that. But it takes time, and it takes money. You just don't go into it if you're if the wolf is at the door financially. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in fact, it's hard to do anything if the wolf is at the door financially. It's hard to even think. You know. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But and one thing I will say in terms of the people who say they want an encore career, um, there's some statistics from um, Metropolitan Life and, then, and Mark Friedman's uh, former Civic Ventures. He said that 9 million of them, aged 44 to 70, are already say they're already in their encore career. But there's another whole 30-some million of them that want to join that. and um, But half of them say... It's going to be difficult because uh, to transition like that because of financial insecurity. Right. You know? Right. Um, you know, I just went to that Aging in America conference in March in Chicago, and they were very much focused on um, physical well-being, um, mental well-being, and financial well-being. And the you know the the financial situation for a lot of people who didn't save money and, you know, don't have a fallback position is, in many cases, quite dire. And that would make that year of, you know, looking for work, that 53 weeks, which, as you said, is just an average, uh, kind of dicey for a lot of people, make it very, very scary. Much. Yeah. So, so they, they get very interested in getting some help and getting clarity and writing a good resume and, you know, identifying a course of action and, and moving along. Um, and I, I know that's also true of the people that are, are starting their own entrepreneurial ventures. The, the nice thing about being a, uh, a solopreneur is that the capital required for it is usually not as onerous as it is in many other types of businesses because your capital is the expertise that you already have, the experience that you have, what you already know, and what you are doing is finding a way to market and sell what you know 
as some sort of a service as, you know, you might be a coach, you could be a teacher, you could be a trainer, you know, you could be a writer, you can be a blogger, you can, you know, in other words, you're, you're sharing what you know as a, you know, after years and years of being in a career. And that doesn't take the same amount of capital, um, you know, that, say, if you were going to start a plywood mill, you know, would take, yeah. or if you were going yeah. to start a brewery or a restaurant or even a beauty salon or, you know, something like that, that's going to take, you know, they all require equipment and employees and capital and, you know, a solo venture doesn't have that, um, you know, that same requirement. So uh, it becomes much more attractive to a lot of people. I met a lot of writers and I've Mm -hmm. talked to recently a lot of editors, you know, people who've got... English and writing skills, and they're going to help writers. They're going to, you know, edit things for them. Um, I've got one woman who's working on editing fiction and another one who's working on uh, editing uh, scientific papers and um, another one who is editing um, uh, documents, you know, like uh, technical writing and, and things like that. So I see services like that show up quite a bit. And everybody's oh. writing a book, you know, so there's a lot of editors needed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So to your point, I would I would say this for our listeners is that there is a a book I, I acquired a couple of years ago called Boomers into Business, and the subtitle is How Anyone Over Fifty Can Turn What They Know into Dough Before and After Retirement. So it's exactly what you're talking about. Lisa yes. Orrell is the, the the author of that. So. That's what you're saying. They'll, they'll turn what they know into making money. Right. It, yes, that's, that's the basis for most um, solo, you know, solopreneurship businesses is turning what you know into, uh, educa- into some sort of saleable product and, um, you know, making it work that way. And one of the things I find is a lot of times people have a hard time identifying what it is that they know. And um, yeah, Exactly. Yeah, they've... As somebody said, the fish can't see the water in which it swims. And uh, I said, yeah, it's kind of like that. They're so close to it, you know, that they can't, they can't figure out how in the world somebody would be interested in, you know, in buying it from them. So I'm going to be doing work in that area of, um, you know, helping people identify what it is that they know. And, uh, you know, we have a local college, Merrillhurst, that does a, a lot with people who are trying to get, um, going in for college credit based on their life experience. So they've got some uh, tools and techniques that they use in this area as well, and I was talking to them yesterday. And I think we're going to, you know, find some ways to um, help people identify what it is that they know that would make a good excuse me, entrepreneurship activity, and then move forward from there. Mm-hmm. So let's change this a little bit and talk a little bit more about you. You've said that you're, you have a lifelong interest in the Orient, a degree in Japanese studies, even from Ohio, and, um, and then now it's calling you, and you're going to travel to Shanghai. And um, So is this just exactly the kind of calling that you find uh, a lot of boomers are experiencing? And and uh, kind of tapping into that passion that they've had forever? Well, I mean, for me it is. I don't know if people would uh, take on, you know, going overseas to take a look at something related to their passion. I mean, there may be a whole cohort of them that go over there to explore uh, and gather knowledge, you know, and... and, uh, uh, look at that space, but you know, as I said, that that's always been an interest for me, and then that I do have a related uh, a business to that that uh, you know got kind of damaged in the uh, in the downturn. But I just feel that calling, and you know, as you said before, um, you know, it's like uh, do it now, don't wait until it's too late. And so uh, I connected with someone over there that's. Uh, Related to uh, my uh, my faith tradition, they they're growing uh, some uh, centers there, and and uh, basically said to me, "Well, why don't you just come over and do some exploring?" You know, and uh, so uh, I chose a sort of a time frame of uh, six weeks, and um, strictly uh, an exploration. I'm not trying to put a box around it. I'm not setting up all kinds of business meetings. I'm, I'm, you know, using my senses and intuition 
intuition as well as understanding uh, how I would like to use my skills and, and the business that I have now in some way that uh, could tie into, uh, you know, that uh, culture, that community. And that's just about really the extent of what I want to put out there to the world because I want to leave myself open to what I might find uh, coming towards me. I mean, we talk about intellectual capital, experience capital. You know, the Chinese aren't going to copy that. As much right. as they're going to copy uh, your physical product. <clears throat> but, um, you know, what, what I find that's um, probably calling all of us boomers to experience something like this at least for me, is last year there was the death of my last parent, my mother, mm-hmm. and Marv was experiencing that, and there's the caretaking and the concern about being away from, you know, the country or from where they are is, is no longer there. Um, and, again, people do want to find their purpose, uh, their divine spark, whatever it is, their dharma, the Buddhists would say. And uh, if they have savings, to support going and exploring and bringing back, you know, what it is. Um, I, I, I think it's great, and I think people are doing something like that, you know. And I want to use my talents in all ways, the language, the business, and helping others in some way tie into that. I can't define it yet, though. That's fabulous. That's absolutely fabulous. What, what a, uh, you know, a great adventure this is going to be for you. So what... what what are the steps you're taking to prepare other than clearing your mind of preconceived notions? <laughs> you should see my house. I have little piles of things everywhere that I'm gathering, you know, and for the, the packing process, which I hate. <laughs> how, much to leave, how much to leave out? Um, well, what I'm doing is actually, uh, you know, I, I have built quite a few connections in the um, Chinese community here, uh, and the Chinese community is not monogamous. You have Taiwan, you have Hong Kong, you have uh, mainland China, basically. And um, and some of those connections, and they're giving me connections of people that are living over there now, both the uh, expats or uh, or native Chinese. And um, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of speaking to people on Skype over there. It's like, what's, you know, what, what do you experience? Some of it is just, uh, you know, I, things I need to know for my trip. You know, uh-huh. that kind of stuff. But there is is to just find out, you know, happening, asking them about what's going on with careers over there, it's, you know, and it's quite different. And um, so when I'm making plans for the different technology um, to continue coaching my clients, you know, in that six weeks that I'm over there. So Skype is the key. Skype is your friend. And, um, you know, I coach most of my clients anyway uh, by phone. So they're not going to know any different uh, from for that. It's just going to be different time of the days we might need to plan to have that those conversations. Oh, it sounds fabulous, and it sounds like a you know a long held dream come true. And um, you know that I, I just hope it's very rich and satisfying for you. I'm not going to use the word successful because you know that kind of a, yeah implies that. Thank you. There's some definition of success, but that it's, you know, that it's rich and sumptuous and and valuable, and that um, you know you are uh, say, oh, that this is what I have dreamed of my my whole life, all the way back to college. You know, when it must have been unusual to to have a major in Japanese studies. You know, those years back in Ohio, it must be it people was been, very. What are you thinking? Very <laughs> odd. I'm surprised my my parents. You know, didn't didn't stop me, but they didn't. Yeah, so I, I find in my own, you know, personal work and in my Better, Smarter, Richer work that lots of boomers are at last taking steps to do what they have always wanted to do, just like you're doing, um, and that following their passion makes them feel very nervous and vulnerable. So do you find that that's true as well? Well, it, I, I do, and, and I would say a lot of that is around money. Um, uh uh-huh. The, 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 the financial uh, shifts that would need to take place for them to um, manifest that change. And, um, and then they uh, would become vulnerable in leaving uh, aside or setting aside, not throwing it away, everything they've done, 
you know, uh, all these years in, in where they had skills that they developed in something, but it isn't their natural talent, um, and they want to explore the talent. It's, like, a little scary to set that over here on the shelf for now and go develop something that was innate, innate in you, and uh-huh. uh, that, that can be scary. That absolutely yeah. can. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that what I've heard you say is that you're very good at um, reminding people, and this is part of our discussion today, that, you know, they really aren't abandoning all of the things that they've spent their life learning. They're bringing them forward and going to apply them in a new arena and a new situation, almost like they have been um, finding ways to uh, create the background and the skills that they need to move into this most recent, um, you know, journey in their lives, you know, that they're going to bring along, uh, you know, their point of view and they're going to bring along that they uh, know how to manage a group, that they know how to uh, find connections, that they know how to uh, solve a problem and clarify issues and, and seek answers, that they know how to bring something in on time, that they know how to evaluate whether or not people are uh, telling them the truth or are competent to work with, then, you know, it might not be in a specific field, but those are all lifetime skill sets that we've gained in the work that we've done, and they are going to bring that forward with them, you know, even though yeah, they might be leaving the, the, the scenario or the, you know, the industry in which they've been working. All that comes forward. You know, it does it does, and, that, and that's an insecure feeling. But actually, how secure is that when you can be fired the next day? Oh, yes, yes. You know, we have long discussions about how secure are you in a job. Come on, <laughs> <You're not. No. laughs> even even though the lenders still are trying to get people to uh, have a a W two and employment, you know, to uh, want to give you a home loan or you know a business loan. Uh, they feel like that's security, and, and you know, and you want to say, hey, get a grip. That paradigm has shifted. That bus has left the barn. And, you know, don't you remember 2008? <laughs> and, you know? Um, how, how about the six-figure uh, uh, air, air traffic controllers that once again are laid off or furloughed? Yes. For, yes. There you go. Absolutely. So, um, you know, what we have done, Laura, is basically used up our conversation time. It's been absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, I would, I'm hoping that some of our listeners are just kind of jumping up and down to learn there's a person like you that they can work with as they make their own uh, career transitions. So how can they find you? They can find me and, uh, at my website, which is Career Choices with laura.com <clears throat> and my email is just laura at career choices with laura.com my phone is 971-208-5852 they're welcome to call me there you'll <clears throat> if you just plug in my name into facebook and twitter and linkedin you'll find my profiles on, on those different social media sites I will say, if I can just comment, that I, I too, have an upcoming book. I, I said, you know, I can't write a whole book, but I'm in an anthology and um, called The Roadmap to Success, and there, it's uh, also co-written with uh, Deepak Chopra and Ken Blanchard and some other authors, and I wrote about, in my particular segment of the book, I wrote it, my title is Finding Meaning, Meaningful Work in the Second Half of Life, and I expect that will probably be coming out <laughs> Well, I'm over in China, who knows, but, they're, you know, within a couple of months. And um, I, I would say to people, if they, if they go to my website, they can go to the Resources tab. They can look at uh, Laura's library, which I have a whole ton of books there about this type of thing with second half of life careers and reinventing yourself and that. Some of them I comment on. Um, lots of books on that. Uh, you can you can actually purchase them right there. They, they each link to... Amazon, but these are books that I chose for people, and um, then they can find out what I do in, in my coaching, you know, in terms of the coaching tab. So well, I, I'm sure that some of our listeners are going to do exactly that because um, you've, uh, you know, you've shown us that you have a great deal of sensitivity and wisdom 
around, um, you know, this finding work and, and finding meaningful work, as you call it, in the second half of life. And uh, I think it's a great market and a great challenge. So thank you for being my guest today. And listeners, I want to thank you for tuning in and remind you that this is Jackie B. Peterson, uh, author of Better, Smarter, Richer, Seven Business Principles for Solopreneurs, and that I am a business coach and counselor, and I work with solos and be they creative entrepreneurs or encore entrepreneurs and people who are seeking financial success in their self-employment. If you go to my website, www.bettersmarterrichard.com, you can download the free ebook, which outlines the seven principles. The book itself is a fill-in-the-blanks workbook, and it helps you to change your thinking. Walk through what it is that you are holding as a underlying belief that is stopping you, and hopefully change your belief system into taking a new direction and finding the financial success you're looking for. If you'd like, I have my study group course online. You can find it at www.opensesame.com. Or if you participate in the Small Business Development Centers, it's also online at www.bizcenter.org, which is part of the Oregon Small Business Development Center Network. This would be just great for you. Next week on our program, we are going to be talking to an architect who is working with encores on the basis of aging in place. This has become a great big field. He's also a solopreneur. And we're going to get some more insights about this huge demographic that we're talking about, the 50-plus boomers. There's 79 million boomers and a total of about 100 million people who are 50-plus in the country. Really an exciting group to be working with. So please tune in, in again next week on Solo Pro Radio, and we'll look forward to talking with you then. Goodbye.